In this section on case studies, we're going to look at four incidents that happened at NCSA over the last year. These incidents will hopefully give you an understanding of how to use the basic principles we talked about in previous videos about performing incident response. The first case study is a Bitcoin incident we saw on one of our clusters. This incident deals with an inside attack that we had. The second study is a pivot, or some people might know it as island hopping. This attack has to do with shared credentials from another institution. The third example will be talking about what we did in regards of the Heartbleed incident. And the fourth one has to do with a PR incident we had over the Crimea events. The HPC Bitcoin incident is the first one we're going to talk about. Let's begin with a bit of a timeline. The administrators for the supercomputer noticed some odd things going on. This is where we, as an incident response team, really rely on system administrators. They're the ones who really understand their systems. Because of that understanding, they're able to let us know when something is out of place or looking odd. The admins on the system noticed something odd. Then when they started digging into it, they saw the term Bitcoin in one of the logs. There is something important to note here. Because these systems are used by many different people for many different types of projects, just because the admins notice the word Bitcoin, that doesn't necessarily make it a bad thing. While admins know their system and realize when something is going on that's different, that doesn't mean they know everything about every project running. In this case, they had no idea if this job was okay or not. But it was suspicious, and that's why they contacted the incident response team. As we just talked about, the alert for this incident came from the system administrators. One of the admins noticed a problem with the job scheduler. Things just weren't running correctly. The admin asked one of the other admins to take a look at it. These two admins didn't notice anything that is an immediate red flag, but they did notice one of the jobs looked odd. The thing that made this one job stand out was the run line you see on the slide. The word that stuck out was Bitcoin. Between things seeming strange about the system and this term Bitcoin, the admins decided to contact security about the issue. When the security incident response team became involved, we contacted the point of contact for the allocation to determine if this was an authorized job to be running. This person suggested that security do some more investigation. While this was going on, the admins did some investigation on their own and looked back on this job and similar ones and discovered there had been lots of jobs run. They found that this incident had logged about 75,000 node hours so far on the system. It took a bit of work to discover this, and one of the other things that was found was that the user had changed the name of the routine so that it would match the name of the project. They thought this would hide what they were doing. However, as you can see, they were not able to hide all of the information being written to the log files as output from the program. Bitcoin was still located in that. This was a fortunate situation. In some cases, this might not be the case. The log file might not contain any indicators like this. However, it should be noted that it was the admins that triggered the alert because they noticed something was not right with their system. Now, if the term Bitcoin had not been present, we still would have been doing an investigation because something was going on. We would have had to dig deeper and work harder, but once IP addresses and ports started being looked at, we would have figured out what was going on. In this case, the port address 8332, coin port. With the information found during the investigation, the response team asked the admins to look into the user's directory and see what kinds of files they had. Using the strings utility found on Linux machines, they looked into the executable files found in the directory. Strings prints out all printable characters in a file. In some of the executable files they looked at, they found the term Bitcoin present. While the system administrators were doing that, the incident response team was consulting the log files from the Bro system and looking at keystroke logs that the system keeps. Based on the information in those logs, the team was able to determine that this individual had downloaded the file, renamed it, and started to tinker with it to get it running on the HPC system. 
the team verified this was actually a bitcoin effort by looking at the ports that the program was using the ports were known to be used for actual bitcoin mining efforts the team identified the user who was doing all of this which gave them the information they needed to know about which project this was associated with the team contacted the pi for the project to find out if bitcoining was somehow part of the project the pi verified that this was true that they were not doing anything with bitcoins they instructed the response team to shut down the program however the team decided to let things run for a bit longer so they could monitor and collect more information while the system used two-factor authentication and it was unlikely someone else was using this person's account the team felt it was important that they still verify this also they wanted to collect more information on what was really going on and to make sure that this was an unauthorized use of resources the communication of this incident involved a few steps the first part was talking to the pi for the resource and we covered that communication in the previous slide while the investigation was going on the resource pi spoke to the director of the supercomputer and then the two of them contacted projects program officer at nsf the incident response team notified the director of ncsa and also legal counsel about what was going on the team made sure everyone up the chain knew something was happening and that it was being actively investigated you need to make sure you take the time to notify everyone who needs to know that's why when you're developing your procedures you need to identify these people while people up the chain might not be able to do anything to help with the investigation they do like to be kept aware of things that are going on since we didn't know entirely what was going on, the team decided to add some more monitoring to the system. As we mentioned before, we had bro logging and SSH keystroke logging already in place. The team added rules to the bro system to begin looking for terms like Bitcoin. The team also started to monitor net flows continually. This slide shows an email that the team received from the admins. The incident began on a Thursday and on Friday the investigation was going on. The admin shut down the process that was running during that time. On that Sunday, the individual came back and started running some more scripts. At this point, the person had modified the program enough to start using the high-powered graphic processors that are a part of the supercomputer system. This was part of the person's team allocation, and they had changed it to the name of the team to try to hide what was going on. The incident team had the admins again look in the directory, and they found all of the source code for RPC Miner and Diablo Miner. This email from the admins shows how important it is for the incident team to have a good working relationship with the system admins. They do a lot of groundwork for you, and they're a very important alert source. Some of the early questions the team had and needed to find answers for were, was this an isolated thing? Was it only this user, or were there others involved? If it wasn't this user, was the account stolen? When the team was investigating these questions and trying to determine if it was just this user, one of the first things they looked at were history files. Where had this person logged in from? They looked at historical syslogs and looked at when was the last time they were logged in. Was it from the same IP address, or was it from some other location, like another country? The logs told the team that this was the first time the person had logged in, and this was the first thing they did. So just based on that information, the team was not able to determine any kind of history. They had to dig deeper. The question remained whether this account was stolen or not. The team suspected that it was not stolen because of the use of two-factor logon authentication. But based on the information they had, it wasn't definite. As a result, the team had to confirm through a contact at the institution the person was working at that this person had their token with them. This required contacting the person at the institution and asking them to go over and knock on the user's door and find out. This is an important point to remember. Sometimes technology does not give you all the answers, and you have to do things the old-fashioned way with actually talking to people. It's also important to note that you really have to confirm you know what's going on. While the team suspected the person, 
Until they actually confirmed it, they did not have all the answers they needed. Some of the information sources that were used for the investigation included the SSH logs. These were used for historical information to determine if the person was logged in at the time of the incident. The team wanted to know what the person did on the system, so the keystroke logs were looked at. The bro logs were looked at to see where the files came from. In this case, the person had not downloaded the files from the Internet onto the system, but the logs did show that they FTP'd the files from their home system onto the supercomputer. The history file for the user was able to show the team what this user was doing while they were on the system. It showed them compiling and working on the source code to get it running on the system. The other thing the team did was look to see if anyone else was doing this. This meant looking for similar jobs running on the system. It also required going through SSH looking for people using the same commands. You don't want to just focus on one user when you're investigating an incident like this. You want to investigate it and figuring out what this person did, but then you want to go back through your historical logs and see if anyone else was doing the same type of things. You also want to take a look at your network flows and see if someone else was logging on from the same IP address. This can sometimes be a questionable activity. The steps the team took to contain this incident were first to lock down the account for the user in question. But since this person was part of a team, and we didn't know at the time if it was one person or several, the decision was made to lock down the entire team's access. The team also looked at closing any security holes in the system that might have aided the user in their endeavors. Unfortunately, with an insider attack like this, there are not too many holes that can be closed. Obviously, the user is authorized to access and use the system. Some of the holes that were closed were improvements made to the monitoring system. Prior to this incident, bitcoins had not been a consideration. With this incident, it was realized that bitcoins would need to be watched for. So changes were made to searches of log files, and the term bitcoin started being looked for. One of the Bro developers created a script for Bro's protocol analyzer to start watching for bitcoin traffic. This script is now part of the Bro and available to all Bro users. As part of the recovery process, the first thing the team did was make sure they had copies of all files. This included all the log files that were available on the system, but also all the files, directories, and hidden directories in the user space. You want to make sure you gather everything possible, because you will often delete and remove all of that information when you restore. As in this case, all those files were removed from the user's directories. Something to remember is that when you are copying files, you don't want to just do a straight copy. What you want to try to do is something like compression. You do this to maintain all the file stamps in the original files. But before you do anything else, you will probably want to do something like a stats. Stats is a Linux utility that returns information on a file. Use the stats command on all the files you are copying and output the information from stats to a file that you can save with the source files. This helps to maintain the original information on the files and just improves your evidence gathering. Make sure you have a good strategy for dealing with all this evidence. Think about how you're going to store it and save it. Will it be secure? Will you know what it is when you look at it? At NCSA, we have a system where we store the data in a directory for each year. Then under the year the incident took place, a directory is created with the incident number and a description about the incident. Don't store the information as part of email. This is nothing but a problem. Obviously, you want to store all of your emails about the incident, but you don't want to store them as part of the email system. There were several lessons learned from this incident. The most important was about paying attention to new technologies and new trends. In the case of this HPC attack, we never thought about bitcoins, even though we have some of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. Bitcoins were becoming a huge thing, and we had resource prime for mining them. We should have paid more attention to these facts. Pay attention to new things that are coming out, and that your system might be ideal for. This attack was also a wake-up about the threat from insiders. 
Prior to this, we had not worried much about insider threats, and this was a good reminder to take that seriously. As a result, changes have been made to our monitoring and alert systems to be more vigilant about this. And finally, at first glance this does not look like an attack, but it was a breaking of system policy which does make it a security incident. Attacks don't just come from the outside and unauthorized people. In this case, it was from the inside and it was a policy breach. We had to notify NSF of the incident and it became an issue for them. If you would like more help with building a security system, please contact CTSC. You can get contact and other information on the CTSC website, trustedci.org. CTSC Online is made possible by funding from NSF, grant number OCI 1234408.